So I'm going to share some history uh, and some of my favorite stories. Putting a talk like this together is difficult because there are so many stories I can't share with you, but they're in the book. So <laughs> if you take the time, you'll you'll uh, hear some wonderful stuff. But I, I chose some that were favorites of mine. And then, of course, some very key moments. So the initial gathering of APP was in the spring of 1966. Now, I noticed our, our friend John Grouts here. John, it's wonderful that you, you've plugged in. I didn't actually anticipate you being here. But John Grout, at that time in 66, uh, was uh, a priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. He actually got to start uh, uh, ministering in McKee's Rocks. But by 66, John was up in the suburbs. And it was John who uh, organized it. By the way, John, anytime I misspeak, you can intervene. Um, it was John who called the first meeting uh, of the group of priests. 19 met up in a suburban parish that John was uh, ministering in. And actually, John had the church hall there. They started the meeting, I think, about nine at night. They wanted to do it clandestinely in the dark. And I think John's pastor didn't quite know what was happening, but he knew there was some kind of a meeting going on. After the first meeting, uh, the minutes came out, and instead of 19 names, there were 19 numbers. No one wanted to be identified by name because, of course, there was some concern that if the word leaked out that this group of priests were meeting uh, on their own, there might be questions about what this was all about. So for the first couple of meetings, they were numbers, not names. And they listed all the issues they cared about. Pastoral assignments, relationship with pastors, uh, priest rights, continuing education. How were parishes structured? What about lay administrators? Shouldn't they be running the show? Our relationship with religious women. Um, and what's the relationship between priesthood and the world? social issues. Gaudium et Spes, a key document for Vatican II, sort of became uh, the second gospel for this group of priests. Um, now, a number of these priests actually have been quite active earlier to this 1966 meeting, particularly in civil rights. So Don McElvain, Don Fisher, Mark Glasgow had all traveled to Selma in 64 and 65 to be part of uh, those marches with Dr. King. So the word got out about these first two meetings. Somehow uh, it's it, it sort of filtered out. And the group of 19 decided that they would now go public. So they sent a letter to all the priests in the diocese and including Bishop Wright, John Wright. And they invited all of them to the very next meeting. I will say, based on what I've read and spoken with people, their relationship with uh, the Bishop Wright was a very interesting one. It was cordial. It was affirming. Uh, Wright said, this is wonderful. Priests are getting together. Only good things can happen. But remember, you have no official standing. Remember that. So John Grout wrote this wonderful reflection um, around 2014 about some of these early years. And he talked about the the priest relationship with Cardinal Wright, but also he talked about um, a, a priest who became bishop in Pittsburgh and then cardinal in Detroit named Dearden, John Dearden. So Dearden served 50 to 58 in Pittsburgh, then went off to Detroit. Wright took over 59 and 69. And um, John Grout reports that Ironically, Dearden, who started as a conservative after Vatican II and he got to Detroit, became quite progressive. Whereas Wright, who started quite progressive after Vatican II, uh, turned that around and became much more reactionary. So they, these two leaders uh, had quite a flip. Both intellectuals, both well-versed in theology and church law. So by the end of 66, they chose their name, the Association of Pittsburgh Priests. They wanted an independent voice. Of course, there was an official group of priests in the diocese, but these people wanted their own voice to be able to have their own meeting, speak their own voice. 
Over the years, I would say the five bishops leading up to the current, Wright, Leonard, Bevilacqua, Wuerl, and now Zubek, all at one point or another asked the group to change their name, thinking that the name was actually misrepresenting who they were. They weren't official uh, in their member. They weren't of officially representing the diocese. Each time they were asked to do that, they respectfully said they would pray about it and got back to the bishop saying that they had decided they would keep their name, the Association of Pittsburgh Priests. As far as I know, the only bishop that attempted or thought about shutting them down in some way was Bishop Whirl. And in an interview with uh, Lou Vallone, a member of a, a Pittsburgh priest currently still, Lou, who was a member of the official priest group, said to me that he told World that he couldn't, by canon law, shut the group down. They had every right as priests to form their own group and speak their right. They had a right to speak. So um, the last bishop, Zubik, who asked them to change their name, um, when they went in to explain to him that after a long series of prayers, they decided not to change their name, Bishop Zubik expressed a great disappointment to which one of the APP members said, well, Bishop, now you know how we've been feeling all these years. Well, John Wright went off to Rome, but he came back in the early 70s to celebrate an annual Labor Day Mass. The APP wrote him a note and said, there is a labor uh, battle going on here and we're supporting the black construction workers. And they said to write, when you come for the Labor Day Mass, we want you to weave into your sermon something about this labor fight with black workers. Wrote, wrote them back, Wright wrote them back and said, no one tells me what to preach about. So the APP wrote him back and said, if you don't address this issue, uh, Cardinal Wright, we'll walk out of Mass after the homily. Wright didn't. And they did. And they held a press conference on the steps of the cathedral. Um, Jack O'Malley told me he thinks Wright never forgave them. In 1992, fast forward here, Kathy Grabowski, wife of former priest Giles, asked APP to open their membership to baptized Catholics. They voted to do it overwhelmingly after several weeks of discernment. There were some dissenters, but the vast majority voted to do that. And so in 1992-93, APP continued with their name, Association of Pittsburgh Priests, but now the membership was open to uh, those who were baptized, not just ordination, but were baptized Catholics. And of course, we know there are some uh, other folks part of APP are not Catholics. In 2004, the APP got a letter from the diocese. I think it was through um, one of the bishops, McDowell, accused them of misrepresenting themselves. He said, to call yourselves the Association of Pittsburgh Priests implies that you represent the diocese officially, and you don't. And so you should be responsible for that and change that name. Warren Metzler, a very active member of APP at the time, said, well, if we were to do that, then the bishops should acknowledge that they are a wing of the Republican Party. So I don't think either group was ready to change their designations at that point. So over the years, I would say there were two major foci for the group church reform, and social justice. On church reform, they constantly wrote and spoke and, and publicly advocated for optional celibacy, women's ordination, team ministry, commitment to the urban poor, simple lifestyle, gay marriage, for people to elect their own bishops, a democratization in the church, for lay leadership, they always went public when they had something to say, particularly Don McElvain. Whenever Don had something to say, even if he did it alone, which he often did uh, have his own press conferences, the press always showed up to hear McElvain. I think 
One of my favorite stories, and maybe one of the more famous ones about APP, um, had to do with when Bishop Wuerl, who was not the Bishop of Pittsburgh yet, uh, but was sent to Seattle, you remember, to basically monitor, monitor Bishop Hunthausen in Seattle, a very progressive bishop uh, who had caught the eyes of the Vatican. And so Wuerl was out there, and really he was sent there to actually uh, undercover basically um, uh, take over the, the diocese. So the APP went public with a letter to World that they sent to the press, but sent to him asking him to um, come home, that this was an inappropriate uh, way for him to do ministry. The AP, which he eventually actually did, was sent back by the Vatican after a year or so. Um, but the APP got this wonderful letter from the director of seminarians in Seattle in 1986. I thank you for your vision, courage, and wonderful sense of strategy in your recommendation that Bishop Don World resign in support of Archbishop Hunthausen. And um, David Zager, the priest who was head of the seminary then, went on to say how impressive he thought the presence of APP was and how grateful he was for their witness. On social justice issues, um, lots of activity, anti-war, many of the priests did uh, tax withholding, 20% of their taxes to, um, uh, to reject the idea of war, prison reforms, civil rights. Uh, Cesar Chavez came to Pittsburgh a number of times. Uh, Marcia certainly remembers this over on the, the north side at St. Joe's. Um, and Cesar sent the, the group a wonderful letter after some major victories. They worked with the cemetery workers to increase their wages, the Catholic cemetery workers, teacher unions. Uh, they took on the fight of the adjunct faculty trying to uh, unionize at Duquesne. And when the city council uh, in the late 1980s, I believe it was, decided to uh, pass a bill uh, making sure that LGBTQ folks were allowed to teach in schools, uh, they took on that issue, much to the uh, uh, disgust of the diocese and of, of, of Bishop World. And of course, the labor movement, Jack became, Jack O'Malley became a chaplain of the labor movement. A couple of highlights of these activities. On cemetery workers, uh, it was Neil McCauley who realized that they were fighting for better wages in the Catholic diocese. So he gave a public address in front of all the priests and the bishop. Um, the Bishop Zubek at the time, this is more recently, Bishop Zubek claimed to know nothing about this uh, issue. Uh, but nevertheless, he did get on this case. And the cemetery workers came to an APP meeting uh, thanking them because they actually got a much better contract they were ever imagining getting. They took on the issue of uh, Catholic school teachers who are also trying to work on wages. And I want to read this letter. It's very short, but it's so compelling. This was 1985, the Catholic teachers in Pittsburgh. Dear Father Ryan, Reach Ryan was president then, of all the support that our organization was fortunate enough to receive in its recent action, the support of your group had to be the most appreciated of all. The conflict that our teachers endured to strike for a just living wage was heightened for many in the picket lines by parents who voiced their belief that the teachers were violating the Catholic faith. The fact that the teachers were better versed in social doctrine was of little comfort to many. Hence, the presence of your members at the September 6th rally was like a drink of water to our members. I don't know if it's possible to fully thank your group properly but know that your support was responsible for relieving a faith crisis for many of our members. A wonderful presence of APP with the teach Catholic teachers. Another one of my favorite stories and an amazing issue, again, late 80s, maybe early 90s, um, when the city council decided to uh, consider legislation to support LGBT. LGBTQ folks teaching in schools, uh, the diocese took a position against this uh, bill. APP decided 
not only to take a position for the bill, but Neil McCauley offered to go to city council and testify. The night before, Donald World called, Bishop Donald World called Neil, asked him uh, not to take this issue on. And Neil said, Bishop World, I don't think this is an issue of faith and morals. If it were, I might have to follow your guidance. But I think it's an issue of human rights, so I'm going to testify. The next day, he did testify. And John Ostley, who's here tonight, was there that day. And he heard, overheard a man uh, say quite clearly, he said, that priest up there, I bet he's a fag too. To which John just was mortified. He was there in his priestly collar. But he was so proud that APP had taken on this issue. Bishop Whirl also um, called Garrett Dorsey. And he said to him, Garrett, um, what are you folks doing to me? I thought we were friends. And Gary said, we are friends, Bishop World. We just disagree on this issue. By the way, one year later, the diocese reversed itself and dropped its opposition. So the APP, in my view, they never shot from the hip. They always did their homework. And I think that's why they were so effective. They always did research. They never spoke before someone had clearly looked into the issue uh, before they wrote statements or before they spoke up. A couple of documents uh, that they put out there. They, in 1971, Don McElvain and uh, Jean Lauer wrote a, an article that NCR published called Priestly Simplicity. And uh, I had a hard time actually finding it, but at Duquesne Library, I finally tracked it down in Microfish, 1970, 1971, NCR. And uh, Patty Fenton, who was a priest for many years in APP, told me that he was in seminary at the time out at St. Vincent's, and that when he got a hold of this statement about priestly lifestyle, um, particularly simplicity, uh, he circulated it all through the seminary. And uh, he said, Patty told me that that document about priestly simplicity actually sustained him for a couple of decades as what a priest should be all about and, and how a priest should live. In 1983, uh, the APP wrote a wonderful document on priest and politics. I can't find that it was ever published and no one remembers if it ever got published but it was widely circulated. It was a 12 page, well footnoted document uh, on their viewpoint on priesthood. And if you remember now, 1983, we're talking about John Paul II is now the Pope. And I think one of the focuses of JP II's reign, I mean, he certainly did some good things on social documents, but he also did, I think, some quite negative things about priests. And I'm quoting JP to his vision of the priest. The priest service is not that of a doctor, social worker, politician, or trade unionist. The priest has his essential function to perform in the field of souls, of their relations with God and their interior relations with their fellows. This was the APP's answer, which got into the document and they sent off to the Vatican. The priest cannot love the poor in the abstract, but must love them in the flesh. The priest cannot seek justice and righteousness in a theoretical way, but in the circumstances of the time and place where he fulfills his ministry. Work for justice is an essential part of priestly ministry, as it is essential for every Christian woman and man. This work for justice takes different forms in different societies. We, this is the best part. We suggest that when Pope John the Paul better understands the tradition of American priests and other nations, then we will have a better, more constructive, less negative dialogue on how the quest for peace and justice is worked out in priestly ministry. Wouldn't you love to know if JP2 ever actually read that document? Later, some of you remember Pope Francis quoted Pius XI, who once said, politics is one of the highest forms of charity. 
At the end of the book I wrote on APP, I quoted John Sabrino, a Salvadoran Jesuit priest, who wrote about political holiness. And by the way, uh, Bishop John Stowe, a current bishop, I think in Lexington, Kentucky, who wrote the APP a wonderful letter of thanks for sending him a copy of the book, said he appreciated a couple of things in the book especially. One was this allusion to uh, Sabrina's notion of political holiness. But he also raised up the 1992 inclusion of all baptized uh, Christians into the APP, uh, a major uh, decision and change on the part of the APP and who would be members. Stowe also mentioned that he wished the younger clergy could follow the lead of the APP. And at the end of his letter to the APP, and I quote him, as a bishop, I have to confess that I probably wouldn't relish an association of Lexington priests that took public position at odds with my own, as has the APP. Nonetheless, dialogue involves tension sometimes, and Francis gives us a good example of listening to all sides, not avoiding conflicts, and looking for a way to forge together going forward. That was from Bishop Stowe. And then in 2006, one other major document I want to raise up, Gene Lauer, uh, God rest his soul, wrote a wonderful article called The Charism of Priests Today in a book with uh, about a dozen articles about priesthood called The Priest for the 21st Century. In it, Gene talks about the common priesthood, the priesthood of all believers, of the, all the baptized, which Luther made famous. It was revisited at Vatican II, and Edward Skillebeck, a, a Dominican theologian, uh, wrote heavily about in uh, several of his books. In this 2006 article, Gene Lauer suggested that we really didn't have a priest shortage. He said, and this was 06, there are at least 30,000 well-trained lay folks who could be asked to take on every conceivable role that priests do now and in certain circumstances, including uh, presiding at the Eucharist. So we don't have a shortage, said Gene Lauer. Talk about a prophetic document. An issue that APP has been on the case almost from the beginning was the focus on uh, the leadership of the churches, a uh, one issue focus on, on, um, on abortion, uh, almost to the exclusion of other uh, social issues. Most of you remember that uh, Cardinal Bernadine wrote this document called The Seamless Garment of Life, I think around 1986, which APP has promoted uh, all these years. But in the early 1970s, APP was already talking about this issue of what later became this seamless garment of life. Uh, Warren Metzler, in particular, uh, took it upon himself to talk to pro-life people about this very issue. What about the issues of war and peace, of death penalty, of crushing poverty? Aren't those life issues uh, Warren would uh, dialogue with people about? And he sadly reported to APP after many, many conversations that he wasn't making any headway. But the fact that APP, 15 years before Bernardine's um, uh, great piece, were talking about this very issue, once again suggests um, how APP has always been so far ahead of the curve. And I will say to you, and I think it was June of 2022, the current APP leadership uh, came out with a document uh, suggesting, uh, based on uh, the seamless garment, but going beyond it and suggesting a new pastoral approach uh, to this whole issue of abortion. And I quote from the document, APP calls on all Catholic leaders to develop new pastoral spiritual approaches regarding abortion and the culture of life. I think that would be a great document for everyone to get a peek at. So the legacy of the APP, what can we say? As far as internal church reforms goes, at the end of, uh, of my book, 
I referred to a wonderful Carmelite theologian named Connie Fitzgerald, uh, a contemplative Carmelite nun, who in many of her articles in writing about society and the church uses the word impasse. Impasse. In some ways, I think APP and so many others have felt over these years that we've reached a stage of impasse on fighting for church reform. And I know APP is constantly discussing whether it's really worth anymore meeting with our bishops. Are they really interested in dialogue? And yet, I just noticed that we're going to have a meeting with David Zubek tomorrow, if I'm right about that. So way to go, Barbara Finch and, and Regis Ryan and, and the rest of, of APP. They're faithful Catholics, APP, and they're not going away. At one point in APP's development, they had a little bit of a strange in, uh, a change in strategy. They decided that they actually would infiltrate the official priest group in the diocese. So Neil McCauley got elected actually as a member of the official diocesan priestly uh, coalition from 1982 to 1984. And the strategy at that point was maybe we can change things from inside. But if you remember, Bishop Bevilacqua was then Bishop of Pittsburgh, and Bevilacqua pretty much took the agenda of the official priest group and decided what would be discussed and what wouldn't. And in 1984, the APP said, well, that's one strategy that I guess we'll let go by the words, by, by, by the roadside. But as far as church and world goes, I would say there hasn't been an impasse. I think, and I only share a few of these stories, but there are hundreds in the book of, I think, in influence and impact the APP had on social issues. First of all, they were the group that funded the beginning of the Thomas Merton Center in 1972. I don't know that the Thomas Merton Center would have gotten off the ground with APPs, without APP support. We talked about the farm worker boycott. Cesar Chavez coming to Pittsburgh, staying at St. Joe's, the wonderful struggle with the teachers for better pay and this letter that I read, the cemetery workers who thanked APP for an increase in wages, the wonderful, wonderful witness at city council on the human rights of LGBTQ folks in the late 80s. No one knows whether it was Maya Caligiri or Jeep D. Pasquale was president of the city council many years ago. But everyone remembers a quote coming from one of those two people. Whenever a major issue uh, came to city council, the word would go around, what is Father McIlvain thinking? What is Father McIlvain thinking? And I think to myself, as someone who spent time doing community or organizing, that's power. That is power. Why weren't they ever shut down? Besides that anecdote about Lou Ballone saying to Cardinal Worley, he, according to Ken and Laurie, couldn't shut the group down. I think they weren't shut down because there were good faithful priests and still are, and now good faithful lay people, baptized people. They always had integrity. They always grounded themselves in church teaching always prepared to defend their views. They never shot from the hip. They had yearly mountaintop meetings to discern where the group was going. Should we stay together? What should the issues be? Are we making any sense? They studied theologically. They practiced deep spirituality. They talked about tactics. And they always asked, you know, what difference could we be making? And at each point, they said, we need to keep going. Finally, I think the brotherhood now, the brotherhood and sisterhood kept them together all these years. Whenever anyone from APP was called down to the diocese, and it happened very, very often because of some public statement or some public action, and were called down by the bishop to be reprimanded, that person never went down without four or five APP members. They always came down in a crowd. They always had one another's back. I asked Reach Ryan um, 
when I was researching for the book um, about Pope Francis and about the future. And I remember Reed saying to me, in his opinion, the approach of Francis uh, has vindicated APP. Francis is tackling so many of the issues that we care about, and we've been vindicated. The ultimate compliment, and I'll read this and finish my remarks, uh, came from uh, a former professor of mine at Catholic University, a wonderful moral theologian known to many of you uh, named Charlie Curran, who lost his position at Catholic University in the 80s and, and wound up, uh, and he's just now finishing up his teaching career at age 89 or 90 at Southern Methodist University. That's where he went after he was thrown out of Catholic University. In his memoir, this is what Charlie said about um, parish priests. Many priests have told me how they admire the way I have worked for change in the church and dealt with tension and adversity. But I remind them that as pastors, they play a much more difficult role than I. Within any local church community today, there are Democrats, Republicans, liberals and conservatives, rich and poor, male and female, introverts and extroverts, young and old, gays and straights. Parish priests have to deal every day with the tensions and problems that arise from all this diversity, and they must try to both challenge and unify the people of God. If I give more than 5% of my true time to addressing these tensions, that is a lot. So that was Charlie's message. And Charlie, by the way, was an APP speaker many, many years ago and has so admired the the people and when I got a hold of Charlie about possibly writing a blurb for the book, those of you who had a chance to look at the book know that on the back cover, Charlie Curran um, uh, has a little statement about uh, the value of this, this study. So finally, should APP continue? Yes. Should it change its name? No. Although the history is about the 57 years that have gone by, that's what the book's about. For me, the APP is actually about the future, the future of the church, the future of ministry. Anyone who wants to know about the church's future, if it has one, should be looking at the practice of APP. To me, APP is a shining example of how the church and its ministry should look when, if you remember, France is saying it takes 100 years to implement a Vatican Council. We're now in year 57. So I think APP is a shining example of how the church and its ministry, ministry should look when the 100 year arrives with a fully implemented Vatican II. And thanks for coming, folks, and thanks for listening.